Hi everybody, this is Craig from You Are Comp here with another exciting weekly edition post Labor Day with Dr. David Schwartz, the director of the Center for Gaming Research at UNLV and writer for Forbes and multiple time author. How are you doing, Dr. Dave? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing awesome. And I, I mentioned both Forbes and your multiple time author status and because they do tie in well with your most recent article on Forbes about the missing apostrophe at Caesars. So yes. yeah, you know, a lot of people don't notice it or a lot of people notice it and they don't think twice about it, but it is such an interesting piece of, of history. So why don't you kind of walk us through, walk us through the missing apostrophe. So the missing apostrophe is really one of the most interesting things about Caesars palace. And I thought it was something good to write about. Uh, one of my friends who also writes for Forbes, Susanna Breslin, just said in a tweet, like, hey, that would be a great story. I'm like, oh, my God, it would be. Why didn't I think of that? So I kind of took her up on that offer, and it was, it was pretty cool. Basically, just the short version of it, but I still want you to read the story if you can, because it's interesting. Short version is that Jay Sorno, when he built Circus Cir or Caesar's Palace, not Circus Circus, when he built Caesar's Palace, wanted it to be a palace for all of the Caesars, not just one Caesar, so there's no apostrophe in it. So it's a palace for multiple Caesars, a palace full of Caesars. See, so yeah, that is a super interesting story. I love it. And actually, I knew that story already because I read your book, Grandissimo, which covered the life of Jay Sarno, who is a one-of-a-kind character that had a disproportionate impact on Las Vegas when you think back on you know, names. I mean, he's actually kind of unknown to a lot of yeah. like the general public, uh, you know, considering how big of an impact he had. So maybe you can walk us through, I, you know, beyond just Caesars, like what other uh, projects did he influence? So Jay came to Las Vegas with Caesars, but was only there for about really two years. Then he built Circus Circus, which when he first, and I know people today, kind of say Circus Circus, grind joint, family friendly. Back then, it was acceptable for families, but it was not necessarily family friendly because they had a lot of adult stuff there, you know, strippers and stuff like that. So it was very different Circus Circus back then. <laughs> so they, it was just way different. But he had this idea with Caesars of, I want to build this palace. It's a palace for everyone. So everyone's a Caesar. So it's a palace full of Caesars. That was his idea. Now, didn't he make, and I may be getting the facts way off, but I remember reading Grandissimo. And didn't he have, he built like kind of a mini Caesars, like in the Bay Area or something? Yeah. So as his first hotel that he built was the Atlanta Cabana. Then he built the Dallas Cabana. Then he built the Palo Alto Cabana. And he kind of progressively, you can see some elements in each of them looked a little bit like Caesar. So for example, the block, the screen block that used to be the Caesar's facade, that was part, that was it from the start. He really liked that. As he got closer to Caesar's, though, it got more like that. And if you look at pictures of the Palo Alto Cabana, which there is one in Grandissimo, it really looks like Caesars. It's kind of, except it's a little bit more square rather than round, but it looks a lot like Caesars. So he was kind of figuring out what he wanted to, what he wanted to do. And the Caesars, I mean, the Palo Alto Cabana even had Nero's nook. So some people thought that, well, he came up with the whole Rome theme in Vegas for the first time. That's not true because Palo Alto had Nero's nook, which was the Roman themed bar. Nero did have an apostrophe. So there was one Nero, only one. Interesting. Yeah, we don't all want to be Nero. He was kind of an a evil guy. Yeah. If you get a chance, though, Google or look up on YouTube, Peter Ustinov, Nero. It's just fascinating. It's just a fascinating. He has this great rant, and it's just, I think he got an Oscar for this. And if he didn't, he deserved to, because his performance was just incredible as Nero in uh, Quo Vadis, I think. Okay, so this is a movie, or is it a play? It's a movie. So, and this is kind of one of the, so Quo Vadis was one of the movies that, that Jay Sarno would have seen that would have told him this is what ancient Rome was like, because he wasn't necessarily going to go back and read Cicero and Tacitus and people like that. He would see movies and, you know, you've got Cleopatra, which was early 60s, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, which is a comedic take, which I think was also a big influence. 
And then you had Quo Vadis, which was another big one. And that Nero is really big in that. Peter Kistinov, just an incredible performance as Nero in that. Just completely crazy, really cruel, terrible person, but he could throw a really good party. <laughs> and that was like, fine, we're going to call our, our cocktail lounge Nero's Nook, because that's what we want. And that was the whole thing, too. The Caesars, part of the original theme was the all of the stationery had burned edges, well, not burned, but the edges looked like they were burned and all the stationery was fiddling while Rome burns, which was Nero. So it's ah. kind of funny how how big he was into that. That's really interesting. So prior to Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, he had three properties that you just talked about. They were kind of scattered around the US. Now, were those really successful properties? I mean, how did he go about all of a sudden being able to go to the Teamsters and say like, hey, give me 10 million bucks and I'm gonna build a casino. It seems like a big jump. Well, I mean, they were moderately successful. They definitely had a lot of problems, money problems, especially after he sold him. Um, none of them really thrived. You know, actually the Palo Alto did better than the others, but especially the Dallas one had a lot of trouble and he was kind of always running behind with the money because he, he was not a great operator. He was a great designer, but not a great operator. The way he got the money from um, blanking Jimmy Hoffa was that his business partner, Stan Mallon's brother had a connection to an attorney who was working for Hoffa. Hoffa was trying to invest more in the Southeast. This is when they were building the Atlantic Cabana. He said, great, this works. And the two of them, Jay and Jimmy, just kind of started a friendship. They became friends. And that's how he was able to keep on getting loans. Wow. Okay. So 10 million of the 19 million came from Teamsters. Do you have any idea where the other 9 million came from? Oh, from everybody who liked to gamble. Basically, he went all around the country looking for anybody who could who gambled, like any big gamblers, because that was the only people who, who would invest in it. You know, there's a really, I ever had a really interesting talk with Burton Cohen once, who was president of Desert Inn. He was president of a lot of properties. But if you ever see that old TV show, Vegas, they'll say, you know, paging Burton Cohen, paging Burton Cohen. That's because he was a president of the Desert Inn then. Oh, wow. Um, so Burton Cohen told me he was working as an attorney in Florida for this guy who had investment money. And he said, Jay came in and gave him the presentation and unrolled this big scroll. And, and he said he wrote a memo to the partner saying, like, if you invest in this, I will have you committed myself. I'll sign the papers myself. Do not invest in this. This is a sure money loser. And he told me, I kept that memo, you know, for years. And whenever I started feeling too good about myself and too proud of myself, I'd look at that memo and remind, remind me. <laughs> That's funny. That's like when you hear the stories of venture capitalists that Mark Zuckerberg walked in and pitched his Facebook idea or the Google guys and they're like, no, nah, no, nah, this will never work. And then it's like multi, multi-billion dollar companies. That's cool. So Sarno created Caesars, created Circus Circus. And then he had plans for Grandissimo. Yes. Which was actually, again, it never got developed, but it was way ahead of its time. And it kind of, when you say it looks... It, it foretold what a lot of the newer developments would be? Yeah, it was going to be 6,000 rooms. So it was bigger than a lot of stuff that's, that was built. It was going to be huge. And really, he's the one who figured out, you build something really big, you can make a lot of money. And that's eventually what Kirk Corian did and a lot of other people. So he really was ahead of his time for that. He was going to have shopping in there, was going to have stuff like a log flume and a lazy river in the property. So pretty much everything that happened in the 90s would have happened in the 70s if Jay had gotten the money to build the Grandissimo. And why didn't he get the money? Uh, basically, he was not the kind of person who inspired a lot of confidence in investors, especially after having trouble at Caesars, running in illegal trouble at Circus Circus, people were not going to give him that kind of money, unfortunately. Yeah, he because he was pretty loose with cash in his personal life, right? Yeah, I mean, he just basically loved to gamble. So when he got money, he would gamble it. And even when he didn't have money, he would gamble it. So he wasn't really the kind of person who you would say, I'm going to give this guy, you know, my retirement money to put into a casino, which is why the investors didn't really get it. So the perfect combination would have been him with some kind of great operator, maybe like a, I don't know, Sam Boyd. I'm not even sure if he was a great operator, yeah. but like, 
the company Boyd seems like a good operating company now. So maybe like a brilliant designer mixed with savvy yeah. operators. Well, it's really interesting what happens at Circus Circus. So Sarno first leases a property, then he has to sell it. And Bill Bennett and Bill Pennington, who bought it, hire a guy named Glenn Schaefer, who basically can talk the language of Wall Street. So in 1983, Circus Circus Enterprises goes public because they now have Glenn Schaefer who can talk to them. So even the people who are good operators didn't really know that language. So that was kind of the next thing. So the, the cool thing is, well, what if he hires Glenn Schaefer or somebody like that who's got a Wall Street pedigree who can do this? You know, what happens then? Does it actually get built? Or, you know, are there licensing issues because of his past and because of his associations? You know, do people just say, no, we're not, we can't. SEC is going to have a lot of trouble with you being the CEO. So who knows? And so Circus Circus went public. And then when did the junk bonds really come into play? Because that was also like a, a way to... A little bit before that. And that was the other big thing that helped. And that was like 80... 79, 80, 81, building the Golden Nugget, Steve Wynn in Atlantic City was where that really came in. And those two things together really fueled a lot of the 90s growth for casinos. That'll be an interesting article in Forbes eventually is like the financing history of, of Las Vegas. Cause it started, yeah. was, I mean, it started with mob money, right? Yeah. And then was Perry, less, yeah. Perry Miller, was he the first kind of like banker to get in there and start financing things or Perry Thomas. Perry Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. He was, yeah, he definitely was uh, Batley bank. That was definitely one of the first because before that nobody would lend casinos money. Rightfully so because a lot of them went uh, bankrupt and had a lot of trouble. So Valley bank and then Michael Milken and the junk bonds and then maybe more wall street money or Howard Hughes probably sprinkled in there. Some. Yeah, definitely Howard Hughes. That's an important part. Yeah. Well, Dr. Dave, anything we left out about the missing apostrophe and Jay Sarno? And we covered it all. Fun story to write. People like it. So definitely encourage people to take a look. Yeah, absolutely. And if you guys want to learn more about Jay Sarno and uh, his crazy life, check out Grandissimo, written by our man, Dr. David Schwartz. Is it on Amazon? Oh, yeah. Sure is. I'm, I'm pretty sure anything that's for sale anywhere in the world I could... Yeah. The answer is probably yes. Yeah, is it on Amazon? Amazon's the best place to find it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you as always, Dr. Dave. Well, thank you. All right. We'll talk to you soon.